After watching this video, you should be able to describe glucagon-mediated effects, uh, particularly its metabolic effects to stabilize the plasma glucose, as well as some other non-metabolic effects of glucagon as well. Now, if we start with the basic feedback loop for stabilization of plasma glucose focusing on glucagon, we can see here that we have our alpha cells, which are located in the pancreatic islets of Langerhans. They synthesize and secrete glucagon. And glucagon, its primary target for stabilization of plasma glucose is the liver. And there, it increases hepatic glucose production, which releases glucose into the plasma and raises the plasma glucose. Now, in order for this to be a feedback loop, we need to have an odd number of inversions, and that really comes into play with the effect of plasma glucose on alpha cell output of glucagon. And it turns out that probably this is not really direct, uh, being, the, being the most important mechanism. It's, it's most likely an indirect mechanism that's most important. And recall from the previous video on um, regulation of plasma glucose that insulin is synthesized and secreted by beta cells, and there's also probably a little bit of GABA that comes out of there too. And, and in very high concentration, that output goes directly to alpha cells next. And it's probably the release of these substances by the beta cell that is mostly going to be having the effect to inhibit glucagon output in response to a rise in plasma glucose. Now, if we think about when do we have glucagon uh, going up, um, we can work out um, how that would work by thinking first about a, a lowering of plasma glucose, like a hypoglycemia, for example. And that hypoglycemia would then cause suppression of beta cell output of insulin and maybe GABA, and a disinhibition of alpha cells causing glucagon to go up, increase hepatic glucose production, which would then raise the plasma glucose and stabilize it to try to bring it back towards normal. Okay, so we have a feedback loop here that would, would, would entail glucagon from the alpha cells, the liver, and plasma glucose. Now, it's also important to keep in mind that glucagon, its metabolic effects aren't limited to the liver. In fact, there are glucagon receptors on adipose cells that are very important in regulating um, fatty acid release, um, fatty acid breakdown uh, in adipocytes, and those fatty acids play a very important role in going to the liver, being oxidized, providing the energy for gluconeogenesis and also uh, providing the substrate for ketone bodies. And we'll discuss all of that when we go into more depth of the metabolic biochemistry and how that's regulated by insulin and glucagon. But for this discussion, we're just going to focus on hepatic glucose production. Now, um, there's also some other effects of glucagon that we'll discuss at the very end. Glucagon receptors are also found elsewhere that have non-metabolic effects and that have important clinical relevance. Now, just like we did for the insulin video, the, the insulin-mediated effects, we can look at the transduction pathway for glucagon. And um, you can recognize right away from the seven transmembrane-spanning receptor for glucagon that this is going to be coupled to a G protein. Now, contrast that with the insulin receptor. You might remember that the insulin receptor is, is a completely different pathway. It belongs to a superfamily called receptor tyrosine kinases that um, have a, a lot of different um, assembly of proteins and phosphorylations, much more complicated feedback uh, tran uh, transduction pathway than uh, a G-protein coupled receptor would. Now, what we see here is the alpha subunit, the G-alpha-S, bound already to the GTP, and that means that the glucagon must have, uh, must have activated the receptor. You, you recall that there's a heterotrimeric complex that's inactive, the, the alpha subunit is bound to GDP, so we've kind of left that out for simplicity's sake, and we're just starting out with the active subunit um, going to its target enzyme, adenylate cyclase, which makes cyclic AMP from ATP. Now the target of cyclic AMP, um, now cyclic AMP can have some direct effects on its own, but uh, in terms of what glucagon does, most of the effects are mediated through activation of protein kinase A. Um, now, now what we have here is a simplification of cyclic AMP turning on PK. You recall in the previous video on um, the G protein pathways, the GS in particular, that cyclic AMP binds to regulatory subunits as part of the, the inactive PKA complex, and those dissociate, causing activation of the enzyme. Now, that's not shown here just to keep things a little simple.
Um, and, and remember that PKA is a serine threonine kinase, which is going to go and phosphorylate proteins at serine threonine residues. And in this case, we see we have proteins generically listed here as either being active or inactive in a non-phosphorylated state. And when PK phosphorylates these proteins, depending on the protein, those proteins become more or less active. All right. Now, um, when we're talking about metabolic biochemistry and the effects of glucagon, let's say this was a liver cell, these proteins mostly would be metabolic enzymes you know, as part of the glycolytic pathway or gluconeogenesis and, gluconeogenesis and so on and so forth. Um, and we'll get into all those details in, um, in, in other videos. For right now, just understand that glucagon's effects are mediated through PKA, either phosphorylation of already existing proteins and changing their activity, or PKA can go into the nucleus because it has a nuclear localization signal that's, that's unmasked when cyclic AMP activates it, and that can go in and uh, phosphorylate CREB, which you, you recall is cyclic AMP response element binding protein, which then recruits other proteins in a, in a complex way and ultimately affects transcription. So for example, this could be a gene for a metabolic enzyme that glucagon is regulating and in addition to maybe affecting certain enzymes directly by, by affecting their activity, it could actually affect uh, the amount of the enzyme being produced. Okay, so this is a, a summary of the GS pathway, really, um, using glucagon as an important example. Now, if we go back and we think about glucagon and the glucagon receptor, we know that all these effects in the liver are going to be mediated through cyclic AMP and PK because, after all, the glucagon receptor is coupled to GS. Um, and, and it turns out that in addition to those receptors being found on the liver, and we also said fat cells, we'll get to that later in another video when we talk about um, the effects of glucagon on, on fatty acid metabolism, we also have glucagon receptors in other places that we don't normally think about under normal conditions. All right? and, and, and just like the examples we discussed for insulin, there are some um, off-target or uh, non-metabolic effects of these hormones that have clinical relevance under certain special circumstances. And um, the two places that we'll focus on, and this isn't a complete list, um, is the heart and smooth muscle. And it turns out that um, on the heart, if there were glucagon receptors, now I'm telling you that there are, you could predict what the effect on the heart would be because actually um, beta-1 receptors, which are very important in, um, in cardiac function, they're coupled to GS, okay, they're, they're um, what are stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system, and increase in cyclic AMP in the heart excites the heart. So um, the heart doesn't really care where the cyclic AMP came from, e either it's a beta-1 receptor or, or a glucagon receptor, the net effect is going to be the same. All the transduction pathway downstream is the same. So it shouldn't be a surprise that um, glucagon, when it activates its receptors on the heart, causes cardiac excitation. Okay? So, so that's kind of nice because we can use um, our knowledge of uh, physiology of the beta receptor in the heart to predict this effect. And in a similar way, there's glucagon receptors on smooth muscle. This, this is a particularly important in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and we would expect the same kind of, kind of response uh, thinking about the normal physiology that we would get when we stimulate GS receptors, um, like for example, beta 2s on smooth muscle, for example, or other GS coupled receptors. Remember that uh, when you increase cyclic AMP in smooth muscle, you get a relaxation. Okay, you don't get an increase in contraction of smooth muscle. Smooth muscle and heart um, behave differently in response to cyclic AMP. And uh, what you'd expect here is a relaxation of smooth muscle. Okay, now this has some very important clinical significance. So, for example, we um, if we gave someone glucagon, and you might think that, uh, you know, for example, you would give someone an injection of glucagon if they were hypoglycemic. In, in fact, um, patients that take insulin who are diabetic, uh, they really ought to carry around a, a, a parenteral glucagon emergency kit just in case they get hypoglycemic, 
all right? And um, if you do that, you might expect that that could uh, excite the heart a little bit. Now, now, of course, if they're hypoglycemic, they already might have an increase in sympathetic activity anyway. But that's just as an example, if you gave someone an administration of glucagon that way, or you were using it, for example, to image the gastrointestinal tract, sometimes uh, glucagon is used in, in GI procedures to relax GI smooth muscle, we might expect the heart to get a little excited. Okay? We also might expect that if we gave someone uh, administration of glucagon, that we can get enough vasodilation where we might get some hypotension. Okay? So some of the responses that we see when glucagon is given, either cardiac excitation or relaxation of smooth muscle, is predictable by understanding that glucagon receptors are found in these locations. Now, I do want to focus on a, a, one specific example because I, I think it illustrates a nice interplay with some physiology. And that's going back to this effect on the heart. It turns out that glucagon, in addition to being a, you know, a very important counter-regulatory hormone uh, to, to insulin and, and helping stabilize glucose when glu glucose gets too low, okay, it's used, we said, has, has other uses. Uh, you know, it could be used for some GI procedures to relax GI smooth muscle. But it's also used um, uh, sometimes in patients who have uh, overdosed on beta blockers. Okay, so if we go and, and go and take a look at what this might look like, um, here's a heart cell, okay, and there's our beta-1 adrenergic receptor, and, and we're kind of skipping out all the details of the transduction pathway that we understand. We're just jumping right to the cyclic AMP part. And in the heart, PKA is excitatory. It has a variety of different effects that uh, isn't all um, illustrated here. But I do want to point out one of them is that it activates L-type calcium channels through phosphorylation, and more calcium goes into the cell and is, excites the heart. Okay, The heart rate goes up the uh, cardiac contractility goes up, maybe the AV conduction goes up. Overall, I just summarize that all as excitation. All right. Now, when someone takes a beta blocker, all right, we can show that here. You know, we'll put an X through the beta receptor and we'll say beta blockers. Okay. They're taking it often to kind of tone down the cyclic AMP and tone down the PK and tone down the excitation of the heart. Now, if someone took too much of a beta blocker, the cyclic AMP would get very, very low, PK would get very, very low, and you'd get sort of too much inhibition of the heart, and you get a very slow heart rate, a very, a very sluggish contraction, maybe even an atrioventricular block, right? And that would be a potential emergency situation. Someone had an overdose on beta blockers. Well, you might think, well, one strategy is you could try to give them the, the ligand, the natural ligand, to activate the beta-1 receptor. But since this is competitively block blocking it, it's not really, you know, ideal, right? Because you're still going to have those beta, the beta blockers blocking the beta receptor. So it, this works out really conveniently that we happen to have these glucagon receptors also on the heart that we normally don't really think about, except under this particular situation. And if we gave glucagon in a setting of a beta blocker toxicity, we can then bypass the fact that we block the beta receptor and we can raise the cyclic AMP and PKA back up and counteract the effects of the beta blocker. And that's in fact one of the, um, the treatment for beta blocker overdose is you can give someone an injection of glucagon. Okay? And that expl that's explained by this picture. And um, also some people have tried uh, glucagon as well um, as an adju ad, um, adjunctive therapy to uh, calcium channel blocker toxicity too. And we have these, these non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Um, we call this non-DHP uh, calcium channel blockers, like for example, verapamil, that also have a very similar effect at beta blocker toxicity. You get a low heart rate, uh, a, a decreased contraction, maybe even an AV block. And perhaps by by having glucagon stimulation, we can get these channels phosphorylated enough, but maybe we can kind of squeeze some enough calcium through uh, to, to get um, the heart rate up and the contract contractility back up and maybe the AV conduction back up. So um, I think this is a, a nice picture of, of, of why glucagon is used in these settings that have nothing to do really with its metabolic effects.
and, and, it's, and it's clinically relevant. Okay, so hopefully now um, you can describe the effects of glucagon metabolically on uh, stabilization of plasma glucose, okay, understand that it has receptors on the liver as well as fat cells, which aren't shown here, and also other places like the heart and smooth muscle that have clinical relevance, okay. Now, I do want to make one other point before we conclude this video, and that is, unlike insulin, which has receptors on the liver, fat cells, and skeletal muscle, okay, glucagon receptors are not on skeletal muscle, and they don't really have any importance there. And that makes sense, because if you raise cyclic AMP in skeletal muscle, you would increase glycogen breakdown, but the skeletal muscle can't release the glucose into the bloodstream. And since that's what glucagon's really trying to do, it would really serve no function to have glucagon receptors on skeletal muscle, okay? And so it turns out that it's not quite symmetric in terms of receptor expression uh, for the metabolically relevant tissues, right? Uh, the, the glucagon receptors are, are not on skeletal muscle, whereas it, for the case of insulin, they are very important on skeletal muscle because it facilitates glucose uptake. So that concludes this lecture on glucagon-mediated effects, uh, focusing on the metabolic biochemistry, as well as some other clinically relevant effects on heart and smooth muscle.